Yeah. Um, yes, I don't know when we'll be able to visit next time, but I, I will be looking forward to it. It was a year ago now since um, I was last there. This time last year, I was with with Deborah and Tapa. Yes, Did yes, I see you when I came? Did you see me? Yes, we really need to see you. Yes. Uh, and uh, give us tips and guidelines on those other aspects that you have touched on. Mm. Uh, and the support that you have rendered to us. Uh, we are expecting you to give us <laughs> some <certificate>. Mm. <laughs> well, I'm going to uh, yeah. challenge you. I'm going to begin to challenge you now because this is a uh, greetings, Caroline. Um, this is just this is this is actually the halfway point. Um, this week we're number twelve of twenty four, so things are going to change slightly, and I'll be um looking to you guys as well to be using these ideas in your con in the context of where you're at. So that's going to be really interesting, and um clearly. We want more than ideas, we want actions. It's about permaculture is a design practice. So it's about how we actually make things happen. And that's what we're here to do. Uh, yes. right. Okay. And that, and that is already in our tips. We have, we have put it into practical. We are not only theoretical, but practically we are very active on it. It's great yeah. to great to know, Simon, and and I know that yeah. I mean, every, it's, um, it's 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 exciting to me to see people take these ideas and apply them, and it's you always learn something new because every circumstance is slightly different. So you know, the way that we want to invite you to be part of this uh, Academy of Permaculture is, it's a two way conversation and an ongoing conversation. And as you gain experience, you can become a teacher, you can become a mentor, a supporter, an inspiration to other people. So that's also how this works. And I mean, Caroline as well, I see you nodding and you've been through that, you've experienced that yourself. I know that you did some, you, you did studied with Paul and now you've come to us and yeah, it, it's an ongoing process. And that's how I want us to think about it. And I'm learning too, you know, I'm not the fountain of all knowledge. I'm just a, a teacher, you know, my, my ability is to, to pass on things and make ideas accessible. Because uh, mm -hmm. I keep saying the real world's really complicated, <laughs> but we have to find our way through that, you know, which means we have to be able to make decisions and, and, and sort out. Yeah. Anyway, I get ahead of myself. Um, okay. I, I did this. Um, here we go. Yes. Um, just as a few opening thoughts to get us going. Oh, someone's there. Oh, lost it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry. I'm just I'm having to do the the room as well. Okay. Uh, Stella is arriving. Greetings to you, Stella, and welcome. So these are my opening thoughts. We'll have a. We'll stop again and have a have a chat when a few more people arrive. Um. So. There's a couple of different themes that I want to uh, look at this week. And the first thing is within Holmgren's principle six, which is the idea that produce no waste, waste not, want not. And actually within that is this idea that when, what the lesson that we get from nature is everything cycles. There isn't actually an end to things. Um, energy and matter sort of translate in, 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 into different forms and um living matter becomes dead matter becomes a lot living matter again so we, we we we're really encouraged to see that and then begin to understand that okay so as permaculture designers what you're going to be doing is creating designing understanding working with cyclical systems you need to take this idea everything cycles right into your heart because that's the if you like that's the dynamic the thing that drives nature it's it's this it's the completing of the cycles and as designers we want to 
aid that process. We want to speed it up. We want to make it more efficient. And in doing so, realize that we will never run out of resources. In nature, things are abundant as long as we can, if you like, work with the processes. Okay, so this is a key, key idea. Um, I was just looking on the internet just now, and I saw as an advert for a course, nine weeks course, uh, for five or six hours of your time each week, um, $2,400. So I just want you to realize what great value you're getting here on my permaculture course. Um, I don't know much about this course. This is a professional course for people wanting to understand the circular economy, the transition for future sustainability. This is a training course aimed at business managers and middle management people, people decision makers perhaps, about how to make their businesses in tune with the idea of a circular economy, understanding everything cycles. Well, we've been teaching this for decades in permaculture, it's nothing new, and you don't need $2,400. But it's interesting to think, see these ideas really permeating into the sort of professional sphere. And I'm saying about time too as well, because uh, we, we don't have a lot of time. Um, I love this statement, Greta Thunberg, I think she's just turned 20 and, and she's a remarkable person who has created waves around the world. And as a 14 year old child, in her mind, the logic of governments saying they were concerned about climate and climate change, but continuing to invest in coal, gas and oil did not make sense. And she said, well, you're sending me to school to learn, but clearly the adults are not listening to the scientists. Why should I listen to my teachers if you're not prepared to listen to your scientists? It's a kind of a circular argument. She says, we want the change. We demand the change. We are the change. And I think that's really interesting. Instead of putting it outside of herself, to saying, you know, come and help me, rescue me, we want there to be change, we demand there's change. The realization that actually for that to create change, it has to come from you, from your behavior, from your understanding, you know, and this, this idea of permaculture ethics, really thinking about how we meet our needs, our relationships with society, our relationship to the natural world. Everything is kind of connected. She also said, the one thing we need more than hope is action. Once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So stop hoping, start acting. Um, focus on achievable goals, achieve them, then evaluate that achievement and figure out what you're going to do next based on that experience. That's the permaculture design process i want to bring you into that mindset ultimately you are the change the world to make the world to be how you want it to be how it can help meet your needs meet your community's needs you've got to take some responsibility for that that does this the permaculture design process puts you at the wheel you're at the, the heart of things So thinking about everything cycles, how one thing not follows on to another. Um, Greta Thunberg, she's a, a, a from Sweden. Uh, she started protesting at 14. She's now 20. She's set up the Greta Thunberg Foundation. She's practically a world leader. She speaks with such authority and for so many people. And if you don't necessarily feel she speaks for you, I can tell you she speaks for the youth. And there are so many, especially young girls, but also, you know, everybody really inspired by those ideas. And I'll tell you, that's what it takes to create change. No matter what scale you're trying to do it on, um, it takes that sense of responsibility and the sense of putting your energy out there with intent. So I'm going to name, name check our, our sister, Laura Muenguzi who um, is a youth climate activist. Uh, she represented Uganda 
at the uh, as it was it COP twenty seven this year in Kinshasa um, as a part of the youth climate delegation. You know, she's creating ripples in her community. She's inspiring the other uh, uh, young people around her, and she's inspiring. She should be uh, challenging and inspiring us as adults to be leaders. Okay, <clears throat> cyclical economies, energy, uh, uh, resource from waste, produce no waste. This is my theme, part of our theme. Um, this is our visit to Talent Agroforestry Centre. It, it's in uh, Nakaseke, it's a little bit north of, of Kampala. And the gentleman in the blue t-shirt, his name is Andrew Kalema. Um, he used to be a journalist <laughs> and um, he's moved into agroforestry and he's actually Uganda's leading bamboo expert. And um, one of the things that he does at his place is propagates different kinds of bamboo plants, makes them available to other people. He said he, he can't propagate them fast enough. The demand is, you know, it's, 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 it's huge. So, um, as he c propagates his bamboo plants, it creates quite a lot of waste. The trimmings from the, you know, from the bamboo and there lots of bits left over. So, yeah, for sure, he's making things like beehives and furniture and all sorts of crazy, uh, wonderful, creative things from bamboo offcuts. But he also has a lot of kind of waste material left. And I like this idea of a kind of cyclical economy thinking is okay so here's uh andrew talking to some of our team members as clovis uh zainab nandi and um uh uh oh, sorry the name she's got i know the name uh ah i feel terrible now i've forgotten the name um here we are at um andrew's place and he's telling us what he's doing and uh, Nandi's taking some notes in her book, Catch and Store Energy. Um, and, and there's Clovis having a good look. And what we're looking at this, this is the potting mixture that Andrew uses for the plants that he's propagating. Kazora Enoch, sorry Enoch, I forgot your name, my friend. Um, not that you ever far from my thoughts, but yes, sorry. Um, um, and look, this, a little bit hard to see the picture, this is a brick kiln, this is a brick box that Andrew's made, and you can see it's all burned inside, and what he does is, as he fills that up with all of his waste bamboo offcuts, and when it's full, he covers the top with iron sheets and piles soil on top. He fires the kiln, obviously there's air holes in it, he can control the burn. He turns the bamboo into biochar, which he crushes into a powder. And now the soil that he piled on top of the iron sheet on the top, okay, that helped seal the, um, the kiln. Um, but also now that soil has been cooked and it's sterilized. So what he does is he knows he can't be sending out plants to customers, to other places. Um, in soil that might carry disease. So what he does is he keeps goats, he collects the manure from the goats, he composts that manure, he composts that with the biochar and then mixes that with the soil that's been sterilized. So now he knows he's got a bioinoculated, really healthy soil that he's sending his plants out in. So see how he's using the waste products of one system to actually drive the system <laughs> it, it's it's smart and he's propagating plants and he's making those available to other people and um yeah talent agroforestry no waste system really inspiring um i've been we've been chatting this week uh at a test our, our, our brother in Ethiopia. He has also been following this course, not live, but he's been downloading. Um, and he's currently in um, in Lalibela, uh, attending the first Syntropic, I think, agroforestry course 
to be held, I think the second in Ethiopia, the first in Lalibela. And he's really excited about that. Um, and syntropic agroforestry is kind of permaculture. It means modeling from nature to grow very resource efficient uh, uh, food, forage, and by, uh, cash crop systems. We look forward to hearing back from Tess Fahun. And here's a picture of that he sent me last week of them making the compost tea. We've been talking about compost tea. I'm going to be making some on the farm. And here they are making their own, applying those ideas that he learned one week to the farm in the next. So the same as what you were telling me, Simon, you're applying these ideas as you go forward. And that's, I really welcome that. Um, yeah, some daffodils. I just had some pictures of some daffodils. This is the, uh, the, this flower is a symbol of Wales, of the Cymru, of the country where I am, and of St. David, the patron saint of Cymru. And, and it also represents spring. So it's that we, when we see the yellows of daffodils, we know that winter is receding and the days are getting longer. So that's a nice time, nice thing to think about. And just my final thought, I think, oh, a couple of, couple of final thoughts was produce no waste, cyclical systems, a reminder that the icon uh, for that, that um, principle is the earthworm. And here's a quote from, uh, from Jeff Lawton. It's not the soil itself. It's the soil life that is the most important element. And here's our soil food web diagram that we've referred to a few times and reminded that this, this cyclical systems is this, this zero waste systems is, and if we can understand that, then that's, that's actually the core understanding that drives our ability to meet our needs sustainably and in a regenerative way. Okay. Grow food, develop complex ecosystems that provide the food, the medicines, the resources that we need in a way in which we can build ever more complex ecosystems. That's what we're trying to do. And that's what we're learning about. And the final slide here is of um, a sort of spider diagram of a cyclical way of thinking that we use as a tool in design in permaculture. So I'm going to um, introduce this idea to you today and um, I'm going to give you a design model to follow just to now begin to start thinking about how you are going to use permaculture to transform yourself, your home, your community and to inspire and send out a message to the rest of the world so that we can make this change that we know we need to make. Um, we, we, we don't need, to, we need to have actions and to have actions, we need a plan and then we deliver on that plan, but it's a circular plan as we test. Oh, did that create the result that we wanted? Do we need to make changes? Um, here's the thing about permaculture is we go, we start small and slow and we, we progress slowly, slowly in a way in which we can build on itself. So um, there's our opening thoughts. Okay, there's a couple of messages on signal if you're able to reach that, uh, Stella. Um, at about half past five, the Arquiton Trust meeting, and are hoping for some input from us. Um, but anyway, let's let's. What we'll do is I will uh, begin the next presentation and the main presentation, and um, we will. Um, if someone can try and stop me at half past five, so I'll give this about. 35, 40 minutes. And um, I'm going to tell a story. And I'm going to um, talk about the evolution of a real project here in, in the UK. Um, also, I'm trying to, you know, the two the co creators of permaculture, are Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. And 
with David's principles prov provide a lovely frame for the course. So I, I like to follow with principle six. Um, but I also like to make sure I don't miss that because this is the book that really this course is built on. And it's this incredible piece of work by Bill Mollison. And I've also tried to think about what it says in each of the chapters as we reach it. And chapter 12 is uh, a good chunk. Here it is, chapter 12. A uh, good few pages there. And in, in, in the recent chapters, he's been looking at the different climate zones. And the climate zone for chapter 12 is humid, cool to cold climates. So these kind of this is the UK kind of climate, and you're going to see examples of uh, farming and gardening systems in a humid, cool to cold climate. We're in a cool, humid, cool climate. To be honest, it's a pretty benign, um, you know, not too. It's quite a friendly system to grow in, actually, a climate uh, that, that we have here, a temperate climate. And, and it, it frustrates us all the time because it's too cold and it's too wet and we can't quite finish things off. The seasons are a bit short, um, gets a bit too wet sometimes. Um, but actually, um, all things considered, things grow quite slowly and it, it's manageable, you know, um, and um, uh, and so we can do, we're, we're surprising how much we can do. Okay, I found it. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> Cum Harry. Cum is the Welsh word for a little valley. And usually at the top end of a valley as well. And Harry is a name. And <clears throat> many years ago, um, a, a chap called Richard Northridge, actually, and he had studied permaculture, um, started a small market garden growing vegetables up here in the in the Welsh hills. And he, 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 he was, you know, trying to learn, I guess, through the experience and enjoying producing vegetables as a good, you know, good thing to do. And but what he quickly learned was, quickly realized was, here in Wales, we have very poor, you know, quite, no, quite poor soils, quite thin. And we have a lot of rain, which washes through the nutrients, especially the sort of the nitrogen, the sort of energy giving parts of the plants. So in, in, from his experience of growing vegetables in a cool temperate climate was, he needed to build a much better soil. And he thought about how, 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 how he might go about that and asked himself the question, what would be the most sort of available resource that he could use to make you know, to improve his soils, basically to make compost. And um, to cut a long story short, what Richard uh, quickly learned was um, the most available um, a resource for making uh, compost was food waste. Here in the West, we have refuse collection. We have big trucks drive around towns once a week and we put all of our trash, our waste in black bags and they take it away and we never have to think about it. And it goes in a hole in the ground somewhere. And slowly, slowly over the years, people start to realize it's really expensive. It's a huge environmental cost. And actually a lot of what we're throwing away isn't waste, especially not food waste. And then the other thing, of course, we realized was that was realized is if you separate out food waste from the other trash, the other trash doesn't then smell of rotten food. And, and, and it's much easier then to separate it out and find uses, recycle the plastics uh, and the metals and the glass 
and then maybe compost the paper and card and you know so forth um so the beginning of eliminating waste was not to mix it all together and to begin to look at eat those components that's that, that we were thinking of as waste and ask ourselves can we find a higher value use for it and if so how and can we incorporate that into a system that is productive so i have to it's quite a long story this but going back to this is what we're looking at here is an overhead aerial shot of a standard industrial unit you've probably all seen them it's a metal box with a roof and um companies rent them out and they you know do their light light industry in it so let's just have a look at this is a standard unit built by the Welsh Development Agency in the 1970s and Cum Harry took this on well I first went there in 2010 so let's say the early 2000s and um and you can see there's a bit of this so this is actually a railway line there there's a line of trees like a hedge and there'd be a drainage ditch there next to the railway and then there's some trees which are actually on the land and this is where people they used to park trucks and you can see it is bare earth but all the topsoil has been scraped off and it's just you know the hard clay under uh, you know subsoil that um has been driven on for years and very compacted so what um richard northridge learned was for his veg growing project to be successful he needed to find um uh, nutrients to make compost the, the available nutrients the really available nutrients was food waste but there's a problem is that if you start composting lots of food waste it becomes a biohazard you have to be in, in a very regulated environment you have to think about diseases and pathogens and smells and flies and it, it, it gets complicated quickly their idea was to set up a controlled environment inside this big metal shed that they could do aerobic composting in they could make the kind of compost that we want as gardeners and they could make it all from the waste that was already actually the, the, the local county the local councils were already paying money to move this cart this what this food waste around so now they had somewhere to take it to and one of the, what we did was um the organization did was they pioneered a system where people put their food waste in a special container and that is picked up once a week and now because there isn't food waste it's especially cooked food and there's a you'd be amazed how much of it there is in the waste stream and you know out of date things that have, uh, you know anyway um so this was this was this was the state of the organization <clears throat> and here's, here's one of their posters from uh, about 2006. And this is the beginning of uh, trying to educate the public because this was new. This was creating change. It's a change that might create hope, a change that might create other actions. But this was the beginning of trying to educate the population. The town was called Newtown in, in, in Paris and here in Wales and saying challenging people food waste you can let us compost your food waste or you can send it to the landfill the decisions in your hands um so put it in the right bin educating and 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 planting seeds of new ideas into population I'll say it's about 2006. um here is let's say back 2010 this is their food waste their, the composting plant i think i might have showed you the slide already but uh the food waste is here and up to the, the whole the whole area is controlled the public can't go in here this is special collection and things are delivered in kind of you know containers and 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 you know it's a controlled process so the food waste it's actually put inside biodegradable plastic bags so you can make pla you can make plastic you can make plastic out of anything actually out of anything but anything starchy and um so you can actually make 
a bag that will biodegrade, will compost over time. And this is what they use for collecting food waste. And um, what was important is food waste is very high in nitrogen. To make compost, you need to balance that with high carbon content. And the carbon that was available in for composting um, is is narrow diameter wood. It's trees, it's shrubs and uh, uh, hedges and where they cut trees while on power lines. There's a lot of that kind of material. So all of that gets shredded up in this green thing. Um, so it all becomes small particles mixed with the food waste, composted in a special bay, temperature monitored, make sure we've killed the pathogens. And then the compost is moved to the other side of the factory where it's finished. We'll step back from all of that detail because that's not what this story is about. But in this photo here that you see was I was invited to visit the factory in 2010. So 13 years ago now. And here's me doing my site visit. I'm doing my first visit to the site. And I'm thinking, what is here? What opportunities there might be there? They want, they'd asked me to come and look at the factory to talk to them about maybe possibilities, actually what they could do with all this compost that they were making, because their first objective was to remove it from the waste stream. They hadn't, they weren't specialists in growing or farming or anything like that. They were more in the waste management industry. So this was where two different worlds came together. The people who collected the waste and the people who actually wanted to use it. So that's an interesting um, uh, coming together as well. Hello, Gerald. Um, so this is the, there's that factory. There's that big metal box building that I said. Inside of there is all of the, the composting going on. And this is that land, piece of land that I'd said, the soil had been scraped off and it was hammered really hard. This was the bit of land that the people at the factory had said to us, can we build a garden here? And someone had tried and they hadn't succeeded. And that's because well, there wasn't really any soil. And, 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 you know, you're starting from such a, a difficult place that they were kind of, they were failing a bit. Um, but what we, what we thought, what we saw, what I saw was, some of the key infrastructure needed is there, like this uh, polytunnel. Um, and even though there's no soil here, or the soil is terrible, what we have is a very large building. And that very large building could be used to collect a lot of rainwater. And if we had a tank that we could store the rainwater in that was slightly higher than the garden, then we could gravity feed water anywhere we wanted. And because the building's so big, we can, you know, we can store as much, you know, we can, we're gonna catch more water than we can store. So unlimited supply of water above the garden. That's priceless. The second thing we had was an unlimited supply of compost. Well, if we got compost and we got water, we can make soil. And we were absolutely confident of that. And um, so that was my first, my opening thoughts. Um, I also noticed though, that um, you might just notice that there's some, uh, something going on here on the left. And when I asked, I found out that there was somebody who was actually coming to the, um, to this location every Tuesday, um, teaching uh, to have people have to start gardening and I thought oh that's interesting and look here's here's the beds that uh, the teacher had made her name is Emma and um, so when I first came to the locker even despite all this horrible looking damaged soil uh, somebody's doing some gardening so the 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 the, the um, organization Kumhari said to me Okay, Steve, um, what would you do with this space? And I said, I'd turn it into a community garden and, uh, and, and make it somewhere beautiful and abundant that people would want to come to. And they kind of said, yeah, 
kind of laughed a little bit. No, they didn't laugh. They, they said, okay, can you help visualize it? How would you go about? So here's my question to you. You're doing this course. This course is about permaculture design, right? So you're going to take these ideas and you're going to do that to create something. And whatever you're doing will be unique to you. Your site won't look like this and you'll have a slightly different climate and you have slightly different resources. But this is the same process that you're going to go through. This is about turning waste into resources. And I'm, I'm asking you, look around. What do you see? I saw a big roof I could catch water on. I saw a building with compost inside it. I thought those are the building blocks of building a garden. And if I can set the right things in motion, I this this I see every potential. Um, I don't see this bare destroyed earth. I see what it could be. I see that potential. Okay, so um, and look, some basic infrastructure had been put in, and there were some raised beds. But this was like. This is what had been done so far on the project, but they were kind of felt they were losing. They, they didn't have, you can see there's hose pipes everywhere. They were using tap water to water. The problem is you grow things in a polythene house is then it doesn't get the rain. So you got to do it. And you know, it was a very um, disjointed system and they wanted to stop. So they were looking for uh, ideas. And again, is opportunities lie in the waste stream this was like a failed project and they were looking for ideas and you know i happened to come along what you're seeing in this picture is it just so happened this was may 2010 and in may 2010 i just planned to run a two-week residential permaculture design course and so for our field trip within that course i brought the student group to kumhari to this location and i said you're going to be doing a design project as part of your pdc studies you're going to do a design project where we're going to turn this car park into a beautiful organic community garden okay that was the challenge i gave to them and this is what you're going to learn how to do in the second half of this course you're going to learn how to design a complex system like this okay um first thing you do is you observe and we made some base maps we took some measurements and we thought we said to ourselves what is there already we're going to obviously anything that we might do in the future is going to build on what is there already so there's our responsibility um so that was our first Thing we do is to record everything and we from our original observations we drew some more accurate pictures and we tested that we took the picture and we showed it to the people there and they said you know, have we understood this right is there anything else we didn't understand and another thing we did as a group was we created a vision and this lovely sketch is what it could look like and um, it incorporates things like those two polytunnels that were already there, but other elements that weren't there. Um, lots more raised beds. We thought about a space for people, um, and maybe a, a low impact structure that might encourage people to come in. We thought about paths, we thought about access, we thought about shade, we thought about the, 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 the angle of the sun. Um, and we tried to bring these things into our visualization of what we might do. And we showed these pictures to the Kumhari and they said, oh, we love that. OK, how would you do that? And if we were to give you a budget, let's say a certain amount of money, £2,000 or something like that, how would you go about doing that? And so that's the next question. So that then, these, these are the parameters that create your design, aren't they? Is, well, where is the place? What is it we're trying to achieve? What resources do we have? How long do we have to do it? Th these are the kind of fundamental questions that we ask when we approach design. So one of the things that we thought about, th these are the notes from the students from back then, um, they started thinking about, well, could we could 
Look, there's stage one, stage two, stage three, ongoing development part stages. Could we run some little courses? Could we, how would we get, a t how would we get other people interested in our project? Um, how would we communicate what we're doing? Could we run little courses that might draw people's interest? We're obviously going to build around the people who are already coming there, like that gardening group or any other volunteers that might have had. You know, we want to try and get all of that information from the organization so we could weave that into our plan. We start to think about the actual sequence of that and, you know, what months and what weeks might certain things happen. So we've got a sense of where we wanted to go, a sense of what we wanted to achieve, breaking that down into little steps. Look, somebody drew us a little logo. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we had fun with just art ideas about, again, how we communicate ideas. That, that was what we had going. That's what we were thinking about. How do we get people interested in what we're doing? So then we, from making a rough map, we started then making one a bit more accurate and recording the the things that were there already the, and then elements that we knew we wanted to put in so a path was a very key point we wanted to create lots of small allotment plot plots for trainee learner gardeners we wanted to create a space for people so those things we knew and we wanted a pond at the the lowest point of the of the of the garden and we also knew we were going to capture water at the highest point of the garden so we thought about where water was going to arrive and where water is going to leave and how we might get the most from it. We thought about access, this yellow path links together the main entrance, takes you past the main growing area, plus the polytunnels to the, the, the human people space, the roundhouse, back past the, the micro allotments, the learner plots and, and out again. So the first layer of our design took in what was there already and also our key things that we knew we wanted to add and and we thought about the access these, these are step-by-step -step thinking uh, and we started the training we started developed uh, uh, sprouting plants and um i managed to recruit a friend as a very regular volunteer uh the guy on the right there his name is wayne we hired a machine and we started digging holes in the ground. Um, there's a, a youth, a young guy, he was there for work experience. And um, what we're doing now is we're digging post holes. And we'd had this idea. There was a little bit of budget. So we did have some money, it wasn't a lot, but that um, we wanted to build something that was striking. And actually the train line went behind, went past here. So we actually thought, oh gosh, People on the train will see what we're doing here. If, if we make something that looks different, that feels different, that has a different you know, vibe to it, um, it'll get people talking. We want people to be interested in our garden. Let's make something beautiful. Let's make it interesting. And um, we're not randomly placing it. We've thought about it very carefully in advance, how we're going to place the structure so the people enter from here and are kind of attracted by the, the eye, follows you right across the garden, gives you a, a sense of somewhere to go and encourages visitors to come and en enter and, 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 you know, and, 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 and experience the garden. One of the reasons we chose to build this roundhouse from wood is that actually we were on an industrial estate and our neighbor or near nearby uh, was a very big sawmill and they processed you know hundreds of tons of wood there and we could get wood waste like this wood chip uh, these off cuts and things almost free just for the transport and these these tim big timbers we had to pay for um but uh, all in all it was a, a good investment of our money and we assembled those components into an interesting looking structure that gave a, a focus for volunteers, a chance for people to come and learn and work together, experience new things, build something that was striking and beautiful. And in the process, learn skills, meet new people, 
Um, just for example, the guy in this photo, he was completely new to permaculture. He'd been a postman and he'd built computers and he was unemployed and he was looking for a new direction. And I said, come and, um, you know, come and see what we're doing here. And, and here he is making his first, you know, sort of greenwood carpentry. Um, look, you can see all these lovely little plots now that are forming and look at our, our path that we, we'd planned. See how these elements are coming together now and allowing our project, our, you know, to, to, to happen. Um, here's people working on the, on the, on the structure, but on the roofing materials. And, you know, into the second year of this project, already our car park was this is soft, inviting, organic living space. All we did was sticking, sticking, here's a big pile of compost. We just kept to our principles, minimum tillage, keep the soil covered. Um, we use these uh, agricultural um, fabrics because we, we had them, um, but there's lots of other things that you can use. And we only had a few, but we just moved them around a lot. And um, we had access to certain tools, um, but we only needed them when we were building the garden. And as, as the process went on, we started to make long-term friends. Some of the volunteers that were coming and picking the food, we realized they needed it. You know, there were times of the year when they were they, you know, finding food expensive and especially fresh stuff. And, and um, anyway, you can see, um, the more attractive the garden became and the more we began to layer in details and put in little fences and things here, what we found was we've got a broader range of people, volunteers coming. People, the nicer the garden looked, the more people might want to stay and become involved. And for some people, this experience was life changing. Um, that it's, it's very easy for people to become socially excluded or socially isolated. Maybe they've had some illness or some addiction problems or depression or coming back from, you know, from, from childcare or something like that. And people lose their confidence and they lose their, you know, people are part of the waste stream. And part of that question is, how do we reach out and connect with those people who are not engaged? Because they're also resources. So some of our volunteers, as my colleague Emma in the middle, two volunteers are having actually transformational experiences themselves just by being part of something that's you know that's new and that's 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 interesting and 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 and, and so forth um so um in 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 2011 uh something happened which kind of had changed my life and um has impacted impacted on all of us really is these guys came to visit and this is um the uh a basoga team of um uh uh dolan fermio which is welsh for farmers link and this is an active link between people here in wales and and people in eastern uganda and there's uh these six guys came over on a study visit for a couple of weeks and I was invited to show them around or for part of to host some of their visits. Here they are visiting us at Kumhari. And I'm having a conversation there with Moses Katembo, the guy there in the white hat. And he told me some years later that seeing that garden and understanding that we'd done all of that with no fertilizer, with just the compost from the factory, made him realize in his head for the first time that, of course, organic systems are better. He had an aha moment at that point. And um, this was the beginning of a friendship. Um, meeting in 2011, um, I was invited to go to Uganda in 2014 uh, to go and visit them in return. And, in, and, then, and then in that process, I had the idea to maybe go back, which was 2016, to teach, to see how teaching this permaculture course would resonate with people there. So all of these connections are coming around 
the idea of closing the waste stream, of of creating you know inclusive systems that eliminate waste. Uh, seed saving, seed saving is a tool. Uh, we could we need to talk more about that as a topic. Um, sharing of knowledge. What we realized was that as soon as you have a, an, a community garden like this, and if you're doing things in a slightly, you know, experimental way or interesting way, is people want to come and see it. So it becomes your demonstration and training center. And here is, a, a, again, another PDC group visiting the garden um, all those years ago. Uh, and here's some of our produce. You know, this was year two of growing food in a car park and that's those are our cabbages uh you know i rest my case <laughs> uh, pumpkins we had to go all sorts um amaranth uh, dodo which we grew for seed um um you can see now the garden is it's much more established you can see how it was starting to come together these are some of our volunteers doing our very first biochar experiment so now I'm reminded that it's 12 years since we started experimenting with biochar um, and a lot more to say on that subject. Um, we grow ochre that year and um, some of our happy garden volunteers. And there's our garden look two years in. There was that was that dead, you know, uh, uh, dead soil sort of car park. When we first went there, every time it rained, the whole garden would just be a sheet of water. Uh, flowing, and they tried to dry, dr to, to make ditches down the middle of the garden to drain the water. And what we said was, well, clearly your soil isn't porous. Um, but as soon as you add compost and open up that soil, um, when it rains now, the garden holds and receives that rainfall. So making use of waste, holding in the system, building yields. Look, look at the strategic placement of elements now from what was that car park. We've got a very carefully placed, we've got our circular path, we've got our intensive little training beds, there's our tool shed, there's our um, uh, intensive growing space, there's our compost still coming in and so forth. Anyway, on it goes. It was such an adventure. We talked about propagating plants and passing them on. People started to use our little um, low impact building as a training space and uh, yeah, so there's the story of, of Kumhari part one and I'll, um, you know, just, just think about that as a process, how design was a process. Look, we began with nothing but we saw the potential. We asked ourselves, what resources have we got? What is it, what's energies are flowing through this space? We discovered that mm, we can harvest a lot of water. We discovered that there's compost. We discovered that we could build human relationships and connections. And through that, we build a vision. We can communicate that vision using permaculture design to create visualizations step-by-step step, to actually create the you know follow through on our vision using locally resourced materials look if you don't have wood don't build out of wood you build up what you have what we found was we went and looked and we saw what was available and and we used that to set us on our way okay so so you might go well there's a happy story with a happy ending lovely lovely and it was lovely but of course the next thing that happened was Oh, here's it all coming to life. Look, um, uh, working with our volunteers, the, the frog pond full of frog spawn, um, our polytunnel full of you know lovely plants, and a senior volunteer there. Um, we started doing our seed saving, um, got reaching out into the town, into the community, offering seed swaps and giveaways. Um, we took over an old shop for for a week to to to, to do you know to, again connect with the community um and then come harry lost the contract to make the compost and the factory shut down and we were told to get rid of our garden and it all had to, to go back to being a car park and we cried it was awful it was heartbreaking um 
So that's us. That's pretty much as we're trying to dismantle the garden. But it wasn't all bad news. In fact, there was some good news. And we weren't in the best location. Okay. Um, and the output of the first project was we'd learned all of this. We'd learned a lot of lessons. We gained a lot of experience. We had a lot to offer and we managed to win funding. We managed to use the experience of that garden to go away and get some money from the government and which gave us a three year window to create something new. And that process, we called it get growing and we had three years. It gave me a part time job, I think two days a week and also for Emma, two days a week to to take what we learned on project one and apply it to project two. So again, this is like recycling on a on a higher level. Uh, I realized that we had to take every component of the first project and recycle it into the second. We weren't starting again. We were taking what we created at the first place and moving it to the second. So this is how it went. Um, this is this is um, some mycelium. This is a fungus. That the high fever fungi, it's actually between two planks of wood. I planted the wood and I saw that. And I saw how the web, the shape, the complexity of that, the way that the mycelial pattern works. And I thought, hmm, that's a model for our garden. That's a model for a community project. It has to have a web of connections going in all directions. It tries to join everyone into that system and process. So the, 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 what, what happened was, this is the story, is uh, this is a uh, sixth form college. This is where 17, 18 year old kids go to learn vocational skills and farming, hairdressing, you know, motorcycle mending, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, cooking. I don't I forget. I don't know what. Um, so there's the buildings and there's their car park. And the college had acquired this bit of land. And the, there's a, a little bungalow there and a and a, a agricultural shed, and because they teach about farming and 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 stuff, they they'd acquired this site maybe as a horticulture centre or something, but they hadn't used it. And then they heard about us and they heard about our project and they said, "Do you know what? You, this is an unused plot of land. We're not quite sure what to do with it. Uh, would you like to have it for ten years, notionally?" And, and um, you know, we like what you did at, 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 at the first project. Maybe you could do something like that here. So there it is, they're standing on there is that, uh, if we look at that tree there, um, here we are into the land, um, seeing what it looks like. There's the same railway goes past here uh, and then embankment. And there's, a, there's say there's three fields as we can see one two three and a, a little garden in front of the cottage and access into there so great what what great resource and we started to just you know get the size get the shape of the of the, of the of the land and start to tame it a little bit and then we started to we invited everyone that we knew who had interacted with our first project and we brought them together for a meeting and we said, what do you want, guys? Um, how do we meet your needs? How, if we create a, a, some kind of a permaculture, horticulture, demonstration learning center, what, 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 how should we do it? You know, what, what, what do you want? How could we make it you know, suitable to you? And, and we laid out our vision. I love the idea of designing the course designing the center, sorry, designing the, the, the project with students and through students. Uh, so that was an important idea for us as well. Um, okay, right, hello. I'm going to just pause for a short, short second to say, um, stop share.
Oops, sorry. Um, yes, Gerald. Um, what maybe yes, Tim. you could do is if, if if it's a bit early to take a break, but there's another slideshow on on the page. Okay. You, you, so this is I'm, I'm just about the Arkleton meeting. So Stella, have they sent us a link for the Arkleton meeting? Is that what your message was? Yes, they have already sent us the meeting for the Arkleton. Okay. Uh, well, do we it's want to? Five minutes past. Do Do you want to? Would do we? How should we manage it? Should we attend their meeting one at a time? I think it is good for us to attend their meeting briefly in a break. Yeah. We really keep it so brief so that we come back to class. Yeah. Okay. Well, or, or or I could carry on, and if you went and said hello, and then I could we could swap. I don't know if that's a bad idea. General, what do you think? I, I was suggesting we, think, we have a break for a few minutes. Yeah. As we just we could log in talk and to the team here. See if you could brief the team. Yeah. Then we pop in. And uh, it's uh, 35 now. Yeah. Or 36. So if we keep it as brief as possible, let them know that we've uh, jumped out of another yeah, uh, well, training. Can I suggest? Then, uh, so, but, can I suggest that if, if, if you would go and say hello to them, uh, either Gerald or Stella, I'll carry on teaching. And then you can come back and report. And then I, I'm very, because I'd like to say something to them. But I don't want to. Okay. Steve. Yeah. Uh, alternatively, I could hold foot here. I could uh, carry on with the team here. Okay. We can do discussions interactively. Okay. As so you, you, and Stella, are there? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's a good idea then. So what what I suggest is um. What I'm interested in is it, I'm trying to set up. I'm telling the story of a design project that I had a hand in. I want you to be thinking about what's your design project. And and, and so we, we could talk about that a little bit, uh, Gerald, with them. And then I'm just going to put, where's the chat? Sure, I, I can go and pick up the uh, presentation already loaded. Yeah, so yeah, the so one the one that you could have a look at is the Sadimet. Oh, okay. And it's there on that link. If you go onto the page for today, you'll see it. Oh, okay. So let me make you host. So you're now host. Okay, Steve. And I will check out and I'll come back. Uh, after I've reported to them. All right. Okay. Okay, Steve. Are you happy to be in charge? Yeah, okay. sure. I'll carry on. All right. Okay. See you then.